Okay, we're about to head right into Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 5. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. The time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments. I'll finish this out in a group prayer. It's the time of year where we celebrate Jesus' birth. And what better to do than to go back and look at the Scripture concerning the birth of Christ. I like Luke. And Luke chapter 1 is where we will begin looking at the birth of Christ. In verse 5, we see there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. And so we place uh, Herod's reign from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. And we have pretty good uh, handle on that. He reigned for 34 years. He was a half-Jew, an Edomite. Uh, from the descendants of Esau and uh, the southern region. And uh, he was a brutal man, but uh, he was sort of friendly with the Jews. He helped to rebuild the temple and uh, keep the sacrifices going. And so he was not all bad, and we know him as doing a lot of bad things, but... Uh, he was partially friendly with the Jews. We should recognize also that our calendars are certainly not perfect and that Jesus was more than likely born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. So it's not zero on your calendars as uh, we would think. So we're squared away uh, as far as Herod and 34 years of reign. And then we know that Jesus was probably born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. Uh, what we haven't covered yet is why in the world would a half-Jew be the king over Judea? And the fact is that the Israelites were under the fourth cycle of discipline when Jesus was born. If you read the cycles of discipline, you'll know that the fourth cycle involves a foreign army in the land. And then the fifth cycle, of course, is total dispersion of the nation. And so Jesus was born into a country, his home country, that was in despair. And there was another country flying their flag uh, over the land. And so the... Uh, major thought here as we enter the story of the birth of Christ is that the plan of God continues no matter what kind of chaos is going on on the earth. And so many times we get involved in watching the news and seeing what's happening in the world and we forget that the overall plan of God, that is the angelic conflict continues behind the scene and that the plan of God is a great wheel and it's still rolling and it's going to crush everything in its path and nothing will stand in its way. And therefore, we should get on the cart and not be crushed by the wheel. So God doesn't care about the fourth cycle of discipline. He's going to send His child into the world in the midst of chaos to provide salvation for man. Isn't that amazing? God's plan continues. And we should remember that in the period in which we find ourselves in America. God's plan continues. And we should ride the cart and not be crushed by the wheel. And there's all kinds of ways to get crushed by the wheel right now. See, you can get involved in activism. You can get out here in the streets and you can march and hold your sign. And you can make a lot of enemies right now. 
And uh, a lot of my friends want to shoot their fellow Americans because they're communist traitors. And they deserve to be shot, but we shouldn't shoot one another. There's a lot of mixed up people in the world right now. And uh, by the way, you should save your ammunition for the invading armies from different lands and not shoot other Americans. And so we see there's a lot of ways to fall off the cart and get under the wheel. And the whole idea is to be in the plan of God for your life and to ride in the cart and to recognize His grace and that to see all is not lost and that nations come and go and that if you look at civilizations, you will find that all civilizations peak and then they go back down. And it's always been that way in the history of man. There has been no civilization that lasted forever. And so here we are on the journey. And we should have our eyes firmly affixed on Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And be in on God's plan. And so we continue with the story here. A certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And so we see that both, both of these lines are priestly lines. And uh, something um, interesting here is that Zacharias means God remembers. Zacharias means God remembers. And Elizabeth means his oath. Her name, Elizabeth, means his oath. So if you put their names together, it, it says God remembers his oath. And so <clears throat> here we have God remembers his oath to Israel, his oath to Abraham. We saw Wednesday night, Abraham, your descendants will be a blessing to all peoples of all nations. And who was going to be born in the line of Abraham? Jesus himself. He told David, your dynasty, your kingdom will endure forever. And how is he going to do that? The root of Jesse. Jesus Christ is going to be born as the line of the tribe of Judah and continue the Davidic dynasty. And so here their names have deep meaning. And God is about to speak. He's been silent for 400 years. And uh, he's about to remind man that his plan is still rolling on. And they were both righteous before God. That means they were born again Christians or believers, not Christians. Walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord Blameless, that means they functioned under the Mosaic Law, which were the rules for living in their dispensation. So righteous, they were born again. They followed the ordinances. That means they lived by the Mosaic Law. Verse 7, But they had no child. And so this was a black eye in their day. You had to have a child not only... Did you need a child? You needed a male child for your name to continue. And they had no children and uh, had no males. And so uh, they were in danger of losing the family name uh, with no children. It was kind of a uh, lowered you in class, if you will, in that day if you had no children. By the way, uh, you see in verse 6 that they were righteous and they walked in the commandments and ordinances. God uses believers who follow His Word. See, we have a lot of born-again Christian and Christians in our era, but how many of them actually use the Word of God to guide their life? That's the question. So Zacharias and Elizabeth were not only born again, but they used the Word of God to guide their lives. 
his commandments and his ordinances. And so once you say, well, there's a lot of born again Christians out here, but how many of them actually live their life according to God's word? You're going to weed out a lot of believers because they're one thing inside the church house and they're another thing when they get outside the door. How many of them actually walk by the statutes, the ordinances? How many of them actually live the life? And so we see that God uses believers who follow his instruction manual, that is the Bible. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. And God loves to take an opportunity where everything seems to be uh, in bad shape and do what he does. And uh, a lot of times we find out that God uses situations where everything seems impossible to man and he loves to turn it around. Verse 8, So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude was praying outside the hour of incense. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him. We should recognize that he might only get to do this once in his entire lifetime. And uh, this was very important. And so we see that uh, all of his uh, people would have been outside on the steps praying. And here he is about to burn incense at the altar of incense. And <clears throat> for 400 years, nobody has heard from God. And now the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zacharias uh, saw him. He was troubled and fear fell upon him. And so we see that just about everybody in the Bible that sees an angel gets scared and uh, they get fearful. And um, we see many people faint like the guards at the tomb of Jesus. They just fell out. They just fainted. And these were hardened soldiers. And so we should recognize that um, when we enter heaven, we are not going to walk up to God and issue our complaint. See, that's what a lot of people think they're going to do. They're going to, see, I've got a bone to pick with you, God. Uh, no, that's not what's going to happen. And uh, here Zacharias is a man of God. He is humble before God. And even when he sees an angel, he is shaken in his shoes. It's a magnificent sight. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. We should remember that when we pray, God hears our prayer. Should we offer it clean from our priesthood? And that in fact, sometimes... God is, he's, he says, okay, I'm going to answer your prayer, and we don't believe it. See, Zacharias has been praying for a son probably since he got married. And maybe 30 years has gone by, and he's thinking, God is not answering my prayer. But God heard that first prayer for a son, and the answer to his prayer was, Wait. And Zacharias is, is thinking God didn't answer my prayer, but he did. And it, the answer to the prayer was, just wait. The time is not right. You must wait. And so we should recognize that our prayers are being answered. And that uh, many times, behind the scenes, God is working and we must keep our faith and recognize that his plan is perfect, and many times our plan is kind of skewed. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many people will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And this was the Nazarite vow, by the way, that 
be not drunk with wine, but be filled by means of the Spirit. This is a very, in Ephesians 5.18, you see the command to the believer to be like John in verse 15 here. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That means he'll be a great evangelist. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. This doesn't mean that he is Elijah, by the way. It means Elijah was a great prophet to God. He was very powerful. And this means that his ministry will be similar to Elijah's. To turn the right lobes of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And this means that his job was to give them doctrine concerning preparing their minds for the Christ. You see, his job was to give them truth and get them ready to receive the message and the life of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. So he's displaying doubt. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. He's, he's saying, I've come down from the throne room of heaven to de de deliver this message. And here you are standing in unbelief. I can't believe it. And many times we're astonished that people don't believe the Bible and they believe that man walked out of a mud hole uh, and he was a polywog at one point and that God doesn't exist and that we're just free spirits floating around and that death is just blackness and there's nothing on the other side of the grave and uh, we get the feeling you know the human race is the same way unbelief and so <clears throat> we should recognize that this angel and us have something in common when it comes to those with unbelief while we, angel, the angel Gabriel had lived in the presence of God, we live in the presence of Bible doctrine, which is the mind of Christ, and it builds our faith. It's how we commune with God. Bible doctrine is how God makes love to you. And so you need to recognize that while you bask in the glory and the presence of God through Bible doctrine and you increase in faith and His glory from glory to glory, you're built into the same image of Christ. You need to recognize that while you have visited God, the rest of the human race is like Zacharias. They're living in doubt and unbelief. So we're kind of the same as Gabriel when we approach these unbelievers on the earth and these Christians who are wayward children of God. I can't believe you would stand around in lack of faith. But it happens. I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak or communicate to you and to bring you these glad tidings. See, this is a good message. This is your answered prayer. I've been sent from heaven after 400 years of silence. You'd think, you'd believe, you'd just say, Amen, let it be. But here's Zacharias in doubt. But behold, you will be mute and not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. And so he was given a little bit of discipline God led him in on this wonderful plan that's about to unfold, and he can't tell anybody now. He gets nine months to stew upon this message that God has given him, and nobody else in the universe knows, and he can't tell anybody. We're going to see at the end of this nine months, he is going to let loose a diatribe of doctrine 
that he had to formulate. He had nine months to formulate what he was going to say when he got his voice back. And it's going to be a good one. Verse 21, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. What's amazing about this is that, you know, in this day, there had been so many priests killed by God by for not following the protocol that many times when they went in, they tied a rope around them. Especially if they went in the Holy of Holies, and if they went in there and God killed them because they didn't follow protocol, they could drag them out with a rope. And that way nobody else had to go in there and get killed too. And so you have to wonder, when he lingered in the temple, were they thinking, did God strike him dead? What happened to Zacharias? And we're so relaxed about protocol now, Christian believers are more like hippies, and they believe what they want to, but in that day it was real. Verse 22, But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. That means he was excited, but he couldn't tell them what happened. He had the big eyes. He's unseen an angel, and he can't tell anyone. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. He lived a ways outside of Jerusalem in the hills of Judea. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. She hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me to take away the reproach, to take away my reproach, among the people. She was always looked down upon because she didn't have children. And now God is taking that shame away and produced a miracle. Much the same as happened with Abraham and Sarah. And so we have John the Baptist and we have a miracle concerning his conception. He did have a human father and he was to be a prophet, a messenger, a person to preach and make way for the true Messiah. So John the Baptist here is a prophet to Israel, and God has spoken after 400 years of silence. Now verse 26, we're going to move on to some new characters. Now in the sixth month, that is of the pregnancy of Elizabeth, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now I've had a map up here and I want you to recognize that um, right down in here is where Elizabeth and Zacharias lived. And uh, right here is Jerusalem, where the temple was, where he was serving. So you can see that distance apart. But all the way up here is where Mary is from. You see that? Right there where that number 10 is. Right in there. And so quite a bit of diff distance here between the two and we're going to look at uh, part of this story includes some travel and so we'll see that here in a minute verse 27 to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph and so that means that not only they were engaged but officially under the Mosaic law they were as good as married as but the marriage had not been consummated. And we recognize that in a Hebrew marriage, there were stages. And uh, you <clears throat> see that uh, how this thing happened was as many of the Israelite men did not get married until they were uh, 
older and that they were solidified in the community. In other words, they would have had to have grown up and learned their father's trade and they would have had their education and they would have uh, become a pillar in the community. They would have been have they would have had uh, been known by their family name and their own integrity. They wouldn't have been able to make their own money, and they would have been able to afford a wife. That's important because the Bible says that we are to take care of our brides. And it costs money. And I, I find it, I'm almost indifferent in our society that people don't recognize that things cost money. Do you know why? Socialism has destroyed the idea that you're responsible for anything. Look, you are responsible to pay taxes. You yourself. That means you have to have money. And therefore, you go to work. Look, if you have a child, whether it's in marriage or out, it costs a million dollars to raise a child. A million bucks. And that was 10 years ago. I don't really know what it costs now. So that means... That man, you are responsible for every seed in your body that could create another little human. And you better be ready to crank out a million bucks out of your cartilage to pay for each one of those little ones you've got running. It's not my responsibility to take care of your children. And if you don't think you can take responsibility for it, you need to get fixed. See, there's a solution. It's not my problem to raise your kids. And I've done it. I have accepted other men's responsibility when they have denied it. But see, it was part of the Jewish cult culture to have not only yourself established in the community, and have your integrity, uh, people knew your integrity of the community, but to have yourself solidified monetarily. In other words, your prosperity came from your work, and people knew what you did. They knew what sort of work you did. And when we see Joseph, we see a man that has integrity. And he has solidified himself in the community. And this was the first aspect of Jewish weddings. See, if you were a piece of trash, you couldn't get married. Nobody wants to marry a piece of trash who doesn't work, who doesn't get out of bed, who didn't have a career, who has no integrity. This guy, he couldn't have a family, he couldn't have a wife. And so we see that the first aspect of Jewish marriage was the fact that the man was a stable personality. And then, after he was stable, then he could look for a wife. And he was looking for a wife to the same level of integrity that he had. In other words, did she follow the Jewish law as closely as he did? And so, when the man thought that he had spied a woman in the community that suited uh, his integrity level, he might approach that woman's father and say, is she open for marriage? And would I be a candidate? Would you be willing to uh, negotiate with me about your daughter's hand in marriage? And this father would have known this young man. He would have known his stability. He would have known his name in the community, his integrity level. And he would have said yes or no. And the young woman would never know that she had even been inquired about because the father might send the man away and say, no, you're not worthy of my daughter. Go look somewhere else. 
Or he might say, yes. And so if uh, negotiations were to continue, then the two individuals would be brought together. There was always negotiations of a dowry. There were wedding gifts many times to the father. There was different things that took place. But once the hands were shook, there was usually some verses read from the Bible. They separated. And the man left, and you know what he went to do? He went to build a house for his new wife. And he might leave his wife at home with her father for six, eight, ten months, a year, maybe even longer. And he would go and he would build a home for them to live in. And when he got everything ready, guess what? He got all his friends to come over and he said, that he told them, get the wedding party started for I'm going to retrieve my bride. And so the, the friends of the groom would go inside the house. They would begin the party, whether it was killing the fatted calf and breaking out the barrels of wine. And if you know Jews, they do a lot of singing and a lot of dancing. I mean, they will sing and dance at the drop of a hat now. They know how to celebrate. And you can imagine... Then the groom would go and he would rent a limousine, a chariot pulled by fine horses. And he would pull up at his already his wife's house and he would pick her up. And she many times didn't know, see. Every day she woke up and thinking, I wonder if today is the day. So guess what? She got up and brushed her hair and fixed her face a little bit every day because she never knew when the day was going to be. But one day she would hear the clattering of cymbals coming down the street because they always decorated the horses with lots of metal. And she would hear the hooping and hollering of the neighbors saying, here comes the bride, uh, groom. And he would pull up and he would be hooping and hollering and happy. And he would pick up his bride and he would take her home. And they would join the wedding party that had already been started at the house and then the friends of the bride could enter the party also. And so we see here that they are good as, as good as married. They were betrothed. But Joseph, he had not gone to pick her up yet. In other words, he may have still built, been building their home when this happened. Whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin name was Mary, and we'll find out that both of their family lines were part of the line of David. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, considered what manner of greeting was this. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And so we find out, it says that <clears throat> you are blessed among women. And I want you to recognize that Catholicism has it wrong. It, it includes Mary with the rest of womankind. And she is not deified at this point. You see that? The angel didn't say, you are exalted to deity among, above women. It, he, he says to her, you are a blessed member of the human race, female gender. God has found favor with you because you have followed His word. Verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. What it means. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. In other words, he is the hypostatic union, the God-man. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And so it is the continuation of the Davidic dynasty and the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And so he was confirming. She was confirming to the angel that in fact she was a virgin. And there was a lot of work that went into remaining a virgin. And that is very hard among society, especially in our day, because there is a lot of pressure for young people to fornicate. And uh, she had to, had to do a lot of work to uh, not uh, be a fornicator. And she wanted... Uh, this question answered, and the angel had no problem with it. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. In other words, God the Holy Spirit supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell inside Mary's body called the female ovum. See, you're going to be a virgin even when you conceive. That's what God said. And in Isaiah 7, 14, we looked at the scripture Wednesday night. The prophecy for says that the virgin will bring forth a son. In verse 36, Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. In verse 38, a very dramatic contrast to Zacharias' answer. Mary said, Behold the maidservant of God. She says, I am your slave. In other words, Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. That means I accept God's will for my life wholeheartedly. I don't care if I'm going to be the blaspheme of society. She recognized that if she didn't have, if this baby didn't have a human father, she recognized immediately what the society would say. That she's cheated on her husband. And look what's happened. She got pregnant. She says, I may be a slave, but I'm a slave to God. I don't care what man does to me. And so we see the life of faith is not always easy. And it doesn't always agree with society. But we are far better off surrendering to God's will than we are trying to please man. And we have the life of Mary. I'm going to take a break right there and even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth, we're looking at the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 1, we're starting back in verse 39. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah. And so we <clears throat> look at the map once again. This was no small feat. And um, we, if you go by a straight line, it's 81 miles uh, from right here to right here. But the problem is you can't do it in a straight line. You have to drop to either side of this mountain ridge. There's too many peaks in here, and they're very treacherous. And so if you look at uh, some of the maps, you'll see that a perspective route here would have been to drop into the Jordan River Valley and to follow it for some distance, and then come back up the peak 
you'd had to pass through Jerusalem to go down to Judea. And this would have been treacherous in itself, uh, probably a hundred mile journey. And uh, to say the least, this young woman was very tough to be able to travel this distance. Um, there, just in this section right here, there is a 4,000 foot ascent and, uh, and about 10 miles. And I run a lot of mountains and that's a lot of vert. Uh, that's a lot of mountain climbing, and obviously she didn't have a good set of tennis shoes to wear. She was wearing sandals, and this uh, would have been a, a treacherous journey, and to say the least, uh, it was a lot of work, and um, we should congratulate her when we get to heaven about being a ultra marathoner while, while being pregnant. Uh, you know, you can go 20 miles a day if you stay busy on good flat ground where there's not a whole lot of, of problems there. So it took her five days at the minimum uh, of getting 20 miles a day. And, and you can almost bet you couldn't quite get 20 a day in some of this terrain. And so uh, this could have been a, a pretty good journey. Uh but uh, what's amazing about this is that she did it on her own first. And then when the census came, she's going to do it with her husband again. And they're going to go back and they're going to be uh, in Bethlehem, which is not too far away from the hill country where she is traveling here. Verse 40, and entered the house and Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And obviously, being 100 miles away, they haven't heard anything about each other except from the angel. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe le leaped inside her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit. And so this is reflex motility inside the womb. And uh, she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Once again, recognizing that Mary is not deity. She is, in fact, a member of the human race. And, uh, but she has been very blessed to be able to carry the Lord. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And she already recognizes that Mary is carrying the Messiah that would save her from her sins. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. So verse 45, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And now Mary is, uh, we see why Mary was chosen, because she's full of doctrine. And we're about to have a song, if you will, and she comes forth with, it's called Magnificat. And the <clears throat> uh, verse 46, we're going to get to see a doctrinal lesson from a, a young lady here. And you're going to see many of the problem-solving devices that she brings forth, that she used in her life. But you're also going to see the national destiny of Israel. And as a Jew... Your destiny is not the heavenlies. Your destiny is with the land. And uh, so Mary's explanation here has much to do with the nation Israel. So Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And so the very first problem solving device you see here is occupation with Christ. Philippians 1.21 says to live as Christ and to die as gain. And so when we're full of doctrine and we're living life for the Lord, our soul magnifies God. In other words, we glorify God in phase two. It's a reflected glory. In verse 47, we're going to see sharing the happiness of God, another problem-solving device. And my spirit, my human spirit, has rejoiced in God my Savior Habakkuk 3.18 is what she's quoting. And so the rejoicing here is sharing the happiness of God. 
Now in verse 48, she's going to bring forth a doctrinal principle. And that is, inordinate ambition is nothing without the promotion of God. And so in verse 48, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And the doctrinal principle is this. You are not promoted until God promotes you. In all of your human endeavors, and your badges and titles that you work so hard for mean nothing until God is the one that pours the cup of oil over your head. That's how he did David when he was anointed king. God promotes, not man. Psalm 23, 5. Now in verse, in verse 49, we're going to see one part of essence. In other words, she understands the essence of God. For he who is mighty, this is God's omnipotence, has done great things for me. She's quoting from Psalm 71, 19. And holy is his name. So she has learned Sale Jr. Uive. And she is connecting God's omnipotence towards her in his plan revealed. Now in verse 50, she is going to what, uh, recognize what we call gate three, the humility gate. Humility. And His mercy, that's grace in action, is on those who fear Him. That means we recognize God's authority in life. From generation to generation, that means the Father is going to pass down His spiritual legacy to His children, hopefully. By the way, this is the answer for America. If believers were contrite before God and obeyed His Word, we would not have national degeneration. See, that's a very simple answer to today's problem. All right, if you look at the news, the problem is complex. But it only has one source. And that's Christian degeneration whether it is moral degeneration of the religious or immoral degeneration of the outlaws you see if we were contrite before God if we were humble before him we would not find ourselves in the big problems we have now. Verse 51. We are going to see. That Mary understands. God vindicates. God vindicates. For he has shown strength with his arm. She's quoting Psalm 98 1. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their right lobes. In Rome, Romans 12, 19, it says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And so we have to recognize that retribution comes from God. We have to wait on His justice and not ours. Mary as set and she watched her country be pillaged by a foreign army. And she is going to recognize that the Messiah that she's carrying is going to deliver Israel. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I shall repay. She recognized a doctrinal principle. In verse 52, another doctrinal principle, Jesus Christ controls history 
He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. This means that God controls the destiny of nations. And you will see that many times in the course of history, leaders have come from nowhere and they have raised themselves, or God has raised them to positions of authority and leadership and provided blessing to countries and he has also taken down some. In verse 53, we see that Mary recognizes fellowship, the essence of fellowship, Revelation 3.20. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. And anybody who knows that Bible doctrine is the gold from God, is the honey, Jesus Christ is the bread of life, Anyone who has supped in His presence knows the most fulfilling meal that you can ever have is Bible doctrine. Knows what the good things in life are. But the rest who are searching the world for the good things go away like King Solomon. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Nothing fulfills, you see. And so to sit around the table with Jesus Christ and sup on Bible doctrine is the good things of life. And Mary recognized what the good things were. Verse 54, client nation Israel, the doctrine of the client nation. He has helped his servant Israel. And remember that as client nation, they had a job they were a servant of God. They were to evangelize the world. They were to be a warehouse of Bible doctrine. They were to send out missionaries. And they were to uh, show the world what establishment was. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And so he is, he's remembering here his covenants to Israel. In verse 55, the Abrahamic covenant, she's about to review. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Remember that God promised Abraham that the world would be blessed through his descendants. And so Mary had more doctrine than a lot of pastors do now. And it's uh, quite certain why God chose Mary is because she had truth circulating in her soul. Verse 56, Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Now, what you're going to find out is there's two doctrinal believers there. We've got Mary and Elizabeth, and uh, they're both in the plan of God. And they were both righteous before God. And they were both living the will of God for their lives. And guess what? They have compatibility. They have rapport. They have truth. And they are going to be able to encourage one another. Mary is going to have to go home and face the indignation of her neighbors for being pregnant and not having ever consummated her marriage with her husband. So in verse 57, Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So Zechariah's prayers were answered 30 years later. So it was on the eighth day when they came to circumcise the child. They would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But his mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There's no one among your relatives who's called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. 
nine months he hasn't spoken. They know he can't. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. John means God is gracious. Verse 64, Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came all those who dwelt around him, and all these things were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept him in their right lobes, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. He's going to be a prophet proclaiming in the wilderness. In verse 67, this is the message that got stewed upon for nine months. Nine months of pondering and research brought forth what Zacharias is about to say. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So 400 years of silence, in my nine months, months of silence, has broken God's quietness towards Israel, and now his plan is in action, and, he, and the Messiah is on the way. He has raised up a horn of salvation. That means the power. Horns in the Bible. Power. The power of salvation for us. And the house of his servant David. This means the Davidic covenant is coming alive. And he has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets. Who have been since the world began. So you didn't believe any of their messages in the past. And now they're being fulfilled. We looked at messages all through the Old Testament about the birth of Christ. We saw from Genesis and Numbers, Isaiah, Jeremiah, 2 Samuel, Micah, Isaiah, in the Psalms, and Jeremiah, and in Hosea, all prophecies about the birth of Christ. And this is exactly what he's talking about. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And this is going to be fulfilled at the second advent. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant. Not only the Abrahamic covenant and the Palestinian covenant, but also the Davidic covenant. Remember that He promised Abraham that His descendants shall number the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. So that means going to be a lot of Jews in the land. The Palestinian covenant was the land contract. And he told Abraham, look all the way around you in every direction. Your, your descendants will possess this land. And he told David, your dynasty, your kingdom will endure forever. So he's saying all three of these. Verse 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we be delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. That's going to happen in the millennium. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. In verse 76, now he is going to prophesy over his child. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will be go for the face, go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. It means he's going to prepare Israel for the first advent. To give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. For the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring. From on high has visited us. The day spring is an interesting word. Anatole. It's used for a rising star or sun. Or a sprouting of a plant. Anatole. Remember when I told you about the root of Jesse? Anatole. The day spring. Jesus Christ is the root of Jesse. While the stump had been cut off, a sprout had come forth. 
And Jesus is the day spring. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. That means to unbelievers. To guide our feet into the way of peace. That's reconciliation. And so we see that the big sermon from Zacharias that took nine months to prepare were in fact <clears throat> that God's plan moves on and Israel has not been abandoned and in fact the Messiah is upon us. So in verse 80 we see so the child grew and became strong in spirit. That means he circulated doctrine. When it was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. That means he stayed in the state of study. And so we know that John was a tremendous preacher and that he turned many Jews before Jesus came on the scene. Now I have a few minutes left and what I want to do is I found uh, something that I wanted to share with you. Not that. Yes, that one. And it's concerning the virgin birth. And we covered this verse on Wednesday night. But it has some uh, points here that I wanted you to see. It's concerning Genesis 3, 15 and 16. And it's the first prophecy of Jesus Christ's birth. And it was given to Adam and Eve in the garden upon their fall and to Satan. And so Jesus Christ, speaking to Satan, says, And I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed, that's unbelievers, they followed him in negative volition, and her seed, that's believers. He, that is Christ, the seed of the woman, shall crush your head. That means the second advent. Unto the woman, he said, multiplying, I will multiply your pain in your pregnancy, and in sorrow you will bear sons. Unto your right man you will have strong desire, and therefore he shall rule over you. And so we see that pain in childbirth and the other problems come with womanhood. So we find out, I want to give you some points from this passage. It's very interesting. A summary of Genesis 3, 15 and 16. This passage says that the human race is now divided into two conflicting camps. You see the seed of Satan, they followed him in negative volition. They're unbelievers. The seed of the woman are believers. The historical phase of the angelic conflict includes the seed of Satan, that's unbelievers, they're influenced by evil. Versus the seed of the woman, that's believers who are influenced by doctrine. Just as angelic forces are divided into two categories of fallen and elect, so the human race is divided into two categories based on attitude towards Jesus Christ. John 3.36 The entire doctrinal structure of the two advents of Christ depends on the doctrine of the virgin birth of Christ. So he had to come into the world impeccable or qualified for the cross and that was dependent on the virgin birth. So point five of summary, the virgin birth is the mechanics for the incarnation and first advent by which Christ accomplishes two victories of the angelic conflict. 
The first victory is the first advent. That's the cross, resurrection, ascension, and session. The seed of the woman is superior to all angelic creatures. That's believers. The second victory is at the second advent. Operation Footstool, by which Christ takes over the rulership of the world from Satan, abolishes evil, and replaces Satan as the ruler of this world. And I taught you Wednesday night that Jesus Christ, when He bana, when He built the woman, He incorporated into the manufacture of the woman the very means of His first advent. In other words, He constructed her differently, totally, than the male. And when he made the woman, he looked at her and he said, okay, this is the means by which I'm going to be born. I'm going to incorporate this into her construction. Point six of summary, the woman lost out in the garden because she rejected the authority, both of Christ as the daily Bible teacher and her Adam as her husband, by the way, the man was at fault more than the woman because he is supposed to gather up his wife when he sees her out in left field. And Adam negated his own authority over his wife in letting her wander into reversionism, if you will. Point seven, the woman regains through receiving Christ as her Savior plus the authority of Gap. See, it's the authority of Bible doctrine which she can gather herself up. The woman listened to the voice of evil in the garden. See, Satan indwelled the house pit. Now she recovers by listening to the voice of doctrine in the local church. Isn't it amazing how Mary knew the Word of God? How in the world did she know the Word of God? How did she know that? So you have to throw yourself at the Bible at some point in your life and learn. All of this is prophesied through the principle of childbearing, i.e., the virgin birth of Christ. And so we see that Mary recovered. See, she recovered and had control of her life. Through Bible doctrine. And if any woman ever had her life together, guess what she had? Bible doctrine. It takes that because if you're going to be under the authority of a man who is highly flawed, you're going to have to have some kind of compulsion to do so. Otherwise, you're going to revolt against him. And God's given him the authority over you. How in the world are you going to live with a man who's heavily flawed and respect his authority? The Word of God in your soul. Just the same as Mary and just the same as Elizabeth and just the same as any other great believer, female of the Bible. Well, we've made it through Luke chapter 1, and we've seen uh, some great characters. Two very strong characters were actually female, and they were great in the eyes of God because they had Bible doctrine in their souls. Well, the beauty of the situation is, is that God has also given us freedom. He has given us freedom to learn His Word here on this earth and we can be much the same as Elizabeth and Mary. We are free to learn God's Word, take it into our own souls, make it a part of our lives, and in fact, be righteous before God. And that's a very humbling thing to be said. I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this morning.